Hello and welcome to my video on the Nikon Z8 and the 15 settings I changed as soon as I got this camera. We're going to start from the basics and go a bit more complex from there. So let's get into it and I'll tell you all about it. So as I was saying, we're going to start with the basics and go forward from there. So the first thing I did as soon as I got this camera is I enabled raw photographs and lossless compression. Yes, there are different compression systems on this camera. I'm not going to get into that now because I haven't really had time to try them incredibly well as regards high dynamic range images and to see how they go. So we're going to stick with lossless compression for now and I'm going to show you how to change it. So to enable raw recording, we go up to the camera icon. Then we move over, we select image quality and press the OK button. Then we move up along through all the JPEG options and there is RAW. We press the OK button to select that. You can see our image quality is now set to RAW. We go down here to RAW recording, which will select the type of compression. There's lossless compression, high efficiency star or high efficiency. As of now, I'm leaving on lossless compression. So the second setting I changed then has to do with the secondary card slot. And yes, I changed it from overflow to backup. What that basically means is in overflow, if I take photographs and if I fill the first card slot, it's then going to send the, the new photographs or the remaining photographs then to the secondary card slot. Whereas what I prefer to do is I prefer to have it set as backup, which basically means is when I take a photograph now, this camera is going to send, let's say, photograph one to both card A and card B or slot one and slot two. So it means you have a backup. So you have a redundancy. So if one of those card fails, I have a fail safe. So we move up to the camera icon, we move over in the photo shooting menu to the secondary slot function, we press the OK button. Now it's set to overflow. Once we go to backup, it's going to copy every photograph to both cards. So the third setting now is bringing us to focus. And the first thing I changed in the focus setting is disabling the autofocus from the shutter button. Now the reason I did that is because I use the AF on button for back button focus on my camera. Now the AF on will automatically work as default in this camera, but the shutter button also works for focus too as well. So what I wanted to do was disable the shutter button for focusing. So when I press the back button focus or the AF on button on the back, that's then gonna focus my image. So we move down here to the pencil icon, we go on focus, and then we move down to option A6, which is AF activation. It's switched on as default. If we go down here to AF on only, in other words, the autofocus will only work with the AF on button now. Select that and that's stored. I'm gonna pop up a separate video on back button focus one of these days too as well, just explaining it in a small bit more depth so you understand what exactly it is I'm talking about. So the fourth setting then has to do with AFC. And when you use this camera as default, when you're focusing, the actual focus point is highlighted in red, even when focus is locked on, which is, is a bit strange because if you're used to, used to using AFS, the, when you're focusing, the camera is going to show that focus point in green. So if you want to be able to change that over for AFC to green, I'll show you how to do that now. We go to focus and we move down here to A11, focus point display. So I'm gonna go on that and you can see you have different options here, but the AFC in focus display is switched off. So if I select that to switch it on, take it out of focus, hold down AF on, and boom, there she goes, green straight away. The fifth setting I changed then has got to do with storing the focus points by orientation. So in other words, you can have your focus point set at a specific part when you're shooting in landscape mode, then when you pop into portrait, then it will go to a different part of the frame. I'm gonna show you, that sounds complicated. It's actually incredibly simple and it works incredibly well. So in other words, I could have my focus point set to the center of the frame when I'm shooting in landscape, but then when I go to portrait, because of the fact that I'm taking a photograph of a person, it'll go up towards the top third of the frame. So it'll automatically swap between portrait and landscape. So to give you an example of how it works, I am focused here on the Nikon badge. When I now turn my camera into landscape mode, you can see that focus point is gone way to the right. We go to focus, we go down to store points by orientation, which is A5. Then we go up and we select focus point. Press the menu, go back out. I'm in landscape mode here now at the moment. I have my spot focus over that. And when I turn now, you can see it's gone back to center here now. So what I can do is I can say, right, that's where I want my portrait orientation focus point. But when I go back to landscape, 
it's now moved again. So that's in focus and now it's moved again. Setting number six that I changed, again, we're still on focus. And as you know, if you're using spot focus, the little joystick here, when I move that up, it'll move that focus selection box up, down, left, right, or whatever else. But one of the handiest things I used to always find is pressing the center on the joystick or pushing down the center will actually recall it to zero. That has now been moved as default to the OK button. So it means you're selecting your focus point here. You don't have to move your thumb down to OK, press the button and then go back up. Whereas what I've done is I've changed that to the center of the joystick. So when I press the joystick down now, it'll actually recall the center point to the center of the image. We move down to the pencil icon, we go down to controls, and we go down to option F2, which is custom controls for shooting. So when you press down on the joystick, this is what it does. So I'm gonna click on OK to select this one. Now, as you can see, there is preset focus point, select center point focus, which is the one I want. So I'm gonna select that. You can see reset comes up on the display. So the handy point here, and you can see is I can move that focus spot around the screen, but when I press the joystick, center button, it goes straight back to the center. The seventh thing I changed then was changing the FN2 button away from the image area selection to the focus modes. So basically when I press the FN2 button now, it's gonna give me the option of changing my focus type. So I can go from manual or AFS or AFC, and then I can change the area selection to as well from spot, wide area AF and all the rest of it via the two thumb control wheels. So that's something I really like because I do it quite frequently chopping and changing from different focus modes. So that is incredibly handy. So again, we go down to the pencil icon, we go to controls, we select controls, custom shooting controls and FN2. And as you can see, FN2 here now at the moment, you can set that to a whole lot of different options. But what I want is focus mode and AF area mode. So when I press this now, that is stored as the focus mode and AF area mode. So when I go back out of this now, if I hold down FN2, I can change from manual focus to AFC, AFS, and back to manual focus again. But not only that, I can actually change from spot to pin to wide area AF. I can select all the different options here now by changing the two thumb wheels. So it just makes changing of focus modes really, really quick. So the eight setting I changed then has to do with focus peaking. So what that basically means is if you're shooting in manual focus, it will actually highlight the areas of the image that are in focus when you adjust your focus ring. So it's incredibly handy if you shoot in manual focus and it's not enabled as standard. So I'm gonna show you now how you enable it. So to enable focus peaking, again, we are in the pencil icon. We go over and we go up to focus and then we move down to A13. So if I go on A13 and if I press select, focus peaking display is off, whereas if I select on now. So to give you an example of focus peaking, you can actually see quite clearly as I vary the focus, you can see the parts that are in focus as they're highlighted in red. Setting number nine is enabling focus wraparounds. So basically what that does is, when I push the joystick down, the little red box is gonna move up and move up, move up and move down, or left and right, when I move the joystick around. But when I go to the bottom of the frame, it's gonna come back out along on the top again. That is focus wraparound. I'd show you here now, it's probably the best way out of it and how to change it. So to enable focus wraparound, we go down to the pencil icon, we go to focus, and we move down to A10, which is focus point wraparound. So that's switched on now. So if I go out, I'm gonna show you what happens here now. So, sorry, I'll actually put the whole thing out of focus, you can see. So if I keep going to the left, what you'll see will happen here now is the focus point comes into the right of frame again. So it keeps going across the screen, whereas before it would have stopped. So you can go up and down. So in other words, if you're focusing something up on the top left-hand corner, let's say, and all of a sudden you see something happen in the bottom right, I can just go left quickly and go up quickly, and there we are in the bottom corner. It's handy. It's not exactly the best setting on the camera, but it is handy at times. Setting number 10. This is huge, and this setting is actually enabled. So why am I talking about it? Because there's a massive amount of subsettings in this, and it's so incredibly easy to use. And for me, this has been by far and away the best thing on this camera. So basically, it's photo memory banks. You say photo memory banks? What the hell is that, Kieran? It's actually settings. So what you can do is you can have four different shoot settings in this camera. So I can have shoot A, B, C, or D. And in my camera, I have shoot A set up for landscapes. 
I have shoot B set up for portraiture. I can have shoot C set up for high speed shutter shot, shutters, shots. And I can have shoot D set up for flash or something. If I see something out of the corner of my eye and I say, oh my God, that's absolutely incredible light. There's my wife or one of my kids or something running around the place. Say, I want to get a shot of that. I can literally pick up my camera. I can press the FN1 button and I can change from one mode to the next just by turning the real rear thumb wheel. So I can go from shoot A to shoot B. So I am changing all of those settings in a split second, which means you will never again miss a photograph. You can go from manual mode with spot focus to aperture priority to wide area AF with eye detection enabled. And so you can just literally be shooting your landscape and go, oh my God, it press FN1, turn the real rear thumb wheel, bang, you're now in portrait mode, fire off your shot and away you go. That is huge and incredibly handy. <laughs> Loving that facility. So that is absolutely massive. I'm gonna show you how to set it here now and what you can do with it. So as you can see here now, I'm shooting in manual mode. I'm in AFS with spot focus and I'm on ISO 64 in manual mode at F11. So let's say I'm shooting my landscape here now and next thing I see off to the right of frame, there's someone over there I want to grab a photograph of. I can press and hold down the FN1 button and once I do shoot A comes up and now if I just rotate the rear thumb wheel, I am now gone to aperture priority. I'm in AFC with wide area AF and my ISO is now an ISO auto too as well with my aperture on F4 because the lowest aperture on this lens is F4. So in other words, I can go shoot B and back to shoot A again. So I'm swapping and changing all those settings in a split second. It literally takes a second. And as I say, you can put in different options then for the other memory banks too as well. So setting number 11 has to do with auto ISO. And yes, you can set your maximum auto ISO. So I've mine set to ISO 1600. And yes, I know people are probably shouting saying 1600 is too high or it's too low. It's a personal preference. It depends on your shooting style and the type of photography you're doing. Mine is set to ISO 1600. And when I'm in manual mode, obviously enough, I'll change the ISO depending on what I want. But just for default, I'll leave it at ISO 1600. But please feel free to change it to whatever you want. And that is incredibly handy. And what I, what I normally recommend with people there is Take, sit down at the kitchen table, take a few photographs at ISO 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, pop them into your camera, or pop them into your computer, edit around the photographs, have a look at them and say, do you know I'm really happy with ISO 3200? Or I'm really happy with ISO 6400? Or you might say ISO 800 is as far as I'm willing to push this. We all have different preferences. We all have different shooting styles and we all have different ways of editing. So do what suits you and um, let's look and see how you can change that now. So in the menu, we go up to the camera icon, then we move across and we have the ISO sensitivity settings. I press the OK button. ISO sensitivity is on ISO 64. Auto ISO sensitivity control is on. Maximum ISO sensitivity setting then you can change to whatever you want. You just select that, move up and I can go 1600, bang, there we go. Option number 12 is enabling the extended Shutter speeds. Now, what the hell is that, Kieran? What this basically is, is on your camera, the slowest shutter speed you can go is a 30 second exposure, right? Without going into bulb mode and having remote releases and whatnot. But would you enable the extended shutter speed selection, you can actually go slower than 30 seconds. You can go 30, 60, 90. You can actually go all the way up to 15 minutes of an exposure which I normally wouldn't recommend doing. So we move down to the pencil icon. We click on that and shooting display. We select that option D and then in option D, we move down to D5, which is extended shutter speeds. So I go on or off. It's set as default is off. We want to switch that on. So now back in my camera settings, if you watch my shutter speed and yes, the image is going to be completely overexposed now, but I can go up to 900 seconds here now in an exposure. 720, 600, 480, 300, 240, 180, 120, 90, 60, 30. Whereas before, 30 was our maximum. So that is absolutely fantastic to be able to do that and switch on that facility. So setting number 13 is changing your flash sync speed. 
So I'm going to show you how to do that. So again, we move down to our pencil icon. We go over and we go on bracketing and the flash sync speed. So it's at set to 1 over 250 FPS. Setting number 14 is a setting I genuinely feel I shouldn't have had to enable. No, it's not a problem. I, mean, I, I can't think of a reason why it wouldn't have been enabled as default. But what it is, is it has to do with enabling the mechanical sensor shutter. So what this does is when you switch off your camera, this sensor cover comes down in front of the sensor. So you can then take your lens off and your sensor isn't going to suck in or attract as much dust. And you might say like, oh, you're still going to get dust in around here. And yes, you are to a certain extent. But the problem with camera sensors is there's sort of an electrostatic discharge inside the camera sensor. And what that does is it creates this kind of like a staticky effect and it just sucks the dust in. If you drop dust down along here, I'm not going to do it because it's a new camera and have the sensor switched on and just switch it off without the mechanical shutter, you'll see that dust fall down and it just drifts in towards the sensor. It gets sucked in on top of the sensor and it destroys the sensor in dust. So having that sensor cover is vitally important in my mind and having it switched on. Now, the only problem you might have with it is if you want to clean the sensor. And that's the only reason why I think it might be enabled as default. So people say, hey, where's the sensor cover? And then you just go and enable it. And then when you want to clean the sensor, you say, oh, I need to disable that setting again. <laughs> Let's get into the menu and I'll show you how to change that. So what we need to do is go down here to the spanner icon and then we move across and you have sensor shield behavior at power off. Now it's automatically selected to off. So what I need to do is press the OK button and go sensor shield closes and select that. The sensor shield will close when the camera is turned off. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. Setting number 15 has to do with enabling the grid view. So if you're a big fan of the rule of thirds and compositionally and whatnot, if you use it a lot, it is very handy. Now you can enable this not only on the back display, but also on the EVF. There's two separate menus for that. I'm going to show you now how to switch that on. But basically what it's going to do is it's going to superimpose your rule of thirds grid over the LCD and the EVF and you can select one or the other but it'll only do it in different display modes which is also incredibly handy because the displays in these cameras can be completely customized. I'm going to show you how to do it. So we move down here to the pencil icon, move over to shooting display which is option D. The viewfinder shooting display is option D18 whereas the monitor shooting display is option D17. So let's say if you want to show it up on your rear monitor you just go in and select that or if you want to show it up in the viewfinder you go in here on D18. As you can see I've already installed it in display 1 but if I want to add it to display 2 for argument's sake it says down below on the bottom press the arrow to the right to set it. So I press the arrow over to the right we can go in then and we can go down here to framing grid and I just press OK and bang that's it it's done. Now that's now superimposed on my EVF when I'm looking through my viewfinder and that's what I'm going to get. So yes I know I said there was 15 settings but there is one more and this one is an important one and this has to do with the starlight setting. What it's going to do is in, if you're shooting in very low ambient light let's say you're going to use flash or whatever else it's going to really help you get that focus nailed on. So it works incredibly well. I'm really happy with it. Now the only slight difficulty and the only slight reason I don't leave it on all the time is because normally when you're looking through your EVF or looking in your back LCD in a mirrorless camera, you can actually see how your exposure is going to look. Once you enable starlight, you can see how the exposure is going to look. So what it's going to do is it's automatically going to brighten the image so you can actually focus on it. So you're not going to see what your realistic results are going to look like. So in other words, if you get your flash settings wrong or your exposure settings wrong, you're going to be looking in the viewfinder and you're going to say, oh my God, this looks amazing. You take your shot, it could be underexposed, overexposed, anything at all. So, but starlight is really handy for a low light setting. Obviously not, because that's where the name starlight comes from, I presume. So, um, so there are my 15 plus settings that I changed immediately on my Nikon Z8. If you have another one and if you said, Kieran, that should be in here, please let me know in the comments down below. But I just genuinely for me, these are the ones that I found made a big difference for me personally. I'm going to have my full Z8 review coming up fairly soon over the next probably two weeks, I'd say. So um, watch out for that one. And um, thanks for watching, everyone. And see you out there.